Hello and welcome to another video. In this video, I'll be providing an overview of the latest version of Maya from Autodesk, Maya 2023. This is the second main release from Autodesk after taking a break and not releasing a Maya 2021. And it now looks like they have reverted back to having a main annual release with point releases spread throughout the year. If you've been using Maya 2022 and its point releases, then you'll likely recognize many of the features in Maya 2023 because features from the point releases get rolled up and included into the next main version. I won't be covering all of those features in this video, but check out the video links here at the top of the screen, and I go through all the features from Maya 2022 and its point release. These videos cover a lot and are really worth checking out if you're jumping from an older version of Maya and straight into this latest version. Some specific features that I'd recommend you look at are component tags for rigging, which replace sets and group IDs. And these allow you to create sets of vertex edge and face components, but they're stored onto the mesh itself. And these can be used and connected to various deformers. There's the new sweep mesh tools that allow you to create a mesh shape from a curve or multiple curves. Plus there's a lot of continued improvements to Maya's modeling and animation features, plus big updates for Arnold, Bifrost and USD. Once Maya has finished booting, you'll encounter the first and most obvious change, the Maya home screen. Now this was something that was first introduced in Maya 2022.1 and is very similar to what you see in other software out there. Now many software vendors have started to use this type of holding screen and UI to get more information front and center to their users and to hopefully provide an overall better user experience. Now, I think this new home screen is part of uh, an initiative to essentially improve that first user experience when trying to use Maya. And, that's, and that applies equally if you're an experienced user or someone who's trying to use Maya for the very, very first time. There's a number of sections here that you can explore and they do provide lots of information and it's all in one place, so you don't have to go hunting around for it in the UI. At the very top here, you've got options to create a new scene, open a current scene, and even set uh, or change your Maya project if you need to. And then we come to a number of different sections. The first one is recent, and here you get a better visibility of any of your recently opened or saved Maya scene files. You can still access these in the usual way from Maya's file menu, but here you do get more information such as the directory location, last modified date and time, and importantly, file size. This next section, getting started, is aimed at the beginner, anyone who's trying to use Maya for the first time. There's two new main interactive tours available that have been introduced to help steer someone through the very basics of Maya before they're moving on to further interactive tutorials that introduce the basic concepts of modeling, animation, and so on. Once having learned the basics, users will then want further and deeper learning. Now, materials for this are included in this learning section. Here you'll find all the main components you need. There's video links to specific video tutorials. There's also a link to Maya's YouTube learning channel. And then there's links to all the materials on Autodesk's community site, The Area. And then there's main links for the official documentation and help, including references to Maya's hotkeys, meld and python commands the next section what's new provides a view of all the new features in the version of maya that you're using so here you get a very simple at a glance view of all the new features and updates and if you click on any one of these here then it will take you through to the specific documentation related to that feature there's also an option here as well in the upper right that where you can enable or disable the what's new highlighting that appears in Maya's UI. And again, this option can also be accessed through Maya's preferences. And finally, in this section, there's community, which contains links to the area forums, all the main social media channels for Maya, and there's also a link to Autodesk's GitHub, where you can obtain code for their open source initiatives, including Maya's USD integration. There's also links here where you could submit ideas and feature requests to the Maya team. Now, if you don't want to do anything on this home screen, then you can go straight into Maya by clicking here in the upper right corner of the UI where it says go to Maya. And this will take you into Maya as normal. But then you can also return to the home screen at any time by clicking the home icon here in the very upper left corner of Maya's UI. You can also return to the home screen by going to the Windows menu, and it's the first option in the list here and that also includes the hotkey shortcut. 
Now, if you're not really bothered about viewing or even using this home screen, then you can disable it. So you don't have to see it every time you boot into Maya. And you can do this by unchecking this box here in the bottom left corner of the actual UI. There's also a simple preference as well that's available in the usual way, just here where you can actually disable the home screen at startup. But there's also an option to disable the home icon in the menu bar, because even though you can disable the home screen at startup, you can still get to it from the home icon. In addition to these options, there's also two new Maya environment variables, Maya no home icon and Maya no home. These are useful for anyone wanting to disable this feature at a team project or studio level as a policy, and they can be set to ensure that the home screen remains off, even if someone's trying to use it. So that covers everything for the new home screen. I'm sure this will be a love hate thing for many users. I've been using this since Maya 2022.1 and I do find myself using it more than I might realize, especially the recent file section. But it will be down to you and how you work on whether you'll like this or not. Now, when this was first introduced, I did wonder if there'd be some kind of update in Maya 2023. But as far as I could tell, there hasn't really been one. And I did wonder if there would be the ability for users to eventually edit this home screen in some way, perhaps to connect up their own internal documentation and then add it as a new section here on the left. But from what I could tell, there was no real preferences for the home screen and there was no options to do so. However, the home screen is just one of many tweaks and enhancements that have been added to Maya 2023 in order to improve the overall user experience, not just for the experienced user, but for anyone coming to Maya for the first time. Let's take a look at some of these now. So the first and most obvious thing you might notice from Maya's UI is here in the upper right corner of the viewport, the return of the view cube. The view cube was permanently disabled from Maya 2018 onwards. And it's fair to say that it was always a very divisive feature among users, even though Maya has always had a kind of similar type of viewport gizmo going back as far as Maya 8.0. And it's interesting now that Autodesk have decided to bring it back. And I think it's mainly to do with helping new users to navigate the viewport and the software. This new view cube does essentially look and behave the same as before, but there's been some small tuning to how it works. And just as before, there's a section here in the preferences that allows you to make some adjustments, or you can even disable it if you don't want to use it at all. Another feature that many will like is the new search feature. Now this appeared in Maya 2022.1 and has had some enhancements and bug fixes going into Maya 2023. And you can access the search tool with the shortcut Control F from anywhere in the uh, Maya UI. And this feature makes it easy to look for menus, tools, commands, and even scene objects simply by typing something into the text field. And even if you don't know the exact name of a tool or feature that you're looking for, you can just try typing different synonyms here and my will return results related to your search. So this is a really good addition. You can even filter out certain things as well if you've maybe got a general idea of the type of feature you're looking for, but you don't quite know where it actually is in the UI. And aside from the shortcut to access it, you can also access it here from Myers toolbox here from the left hand side. So looking around the UI, you might begin to notice a number of small tweaks here and there. Uh, for example, the icon here in the helpline at the very bottom left corner, it changes color to green whenever you hover over something or even select something. Now it's a small thing, but it does help to draw your eye to it because it is there to highlight that there's help available for that feature if you want it. Another small thing that's been added is to the attribute editor. So if you select something now, and you want to keep that node open, this new pin button stops updates to the attribute editor when changing selection. So this allows you to keep a specific node always loaded while selecting other objects. The script editor has also had some tweaks. So tabs here in the script editor now have icons to show what language they actually are, which is good. And you can also save um, all your script tabs out separately to a file all in one go instead of maybe having them reside inside a, a Maya file. There's also a new um, show tabs and spaces option in the script editor that displays tab and space indicators within scripts. 
This is essentially useful when writing Python scripts as tabs and spaces are interpreted differently in Python. Another small thing to call out is the new tablet API. So this is in the preferences um, here. So if you use a tablet with Maya and maybe you have some issues which can happen with different hardware, then it can be very hard to troubleshoot it. But now there's the ability to essentially change or swap out the API which Maya uses and then essentially that might uh, perhaps resolve any issues you might be having. So now you've got a little bit more control over trying to troubleshoot any of those particular issues. Now, another feature that I think is worth mentioning and calling out is the new mesh wireframe opacity. And what this basically means is that alpha channels are now available in the color chooser. So essentially you can set the opacity of the wireframe on your objects. Now you might think this is pretty small and insignificant, but actually I think uh, many will find this really, really useful. Uh, and to give you an idea of what I mean is, um, how many times have you seen this in Maya? We'll get an object and this just give it a stupid amount of subdivisions, like so. And you could have multiple objects in your scene um, all over the place and you just get that with a wireframe and you can't really see anything at all uh, even when they're selected even when they're inactive well now if you go to the color chooser and um, we'll use the inactive settings as, as this example under poly surface um, select the color and now there's an alpha option so now if i dial this down you'll see i almost essentially begin to ghost out the wireframe so I think this will be a really useful feature if you've got a very densely populated scene with multiple objects in it, overlapping each other and so on and so on. And of course you could do this for selected objects or even um, inactive objects like I've got here. So yeah, it's a small thing, but I really do think this will be very useful to many people. And if you wire this up to a hotkey or a button that you can put on your shelf, then you can quickly flip between the different options if you want to. So it's good to see the Maya team address these small annoying things and improve the quality of life inside Maya. And granted, these might not be seen as massive improvements by some users, but if you're using Maya and these features every day, then getting fixes to things that may have frustrated you for some time is always a good thing, in my humble opinion. So I haven't covered everything, but there's lots of these fixes and improvements in this new release. So I've collated some of them here but it's worthwhile going through the what's new documentation thoroughly because it's all too easy to miss something. Before we move on to some specific features in Maya 2023, there's a core component that has been updated that should not be ignored. And that's the Python version that's now supported by Maya. Python 2 was announced to sunset on January the 1st, 2020. But because there was no Maya 2021, Autodesk eventually added Python 3 support in Maya 2022, and by default, Maya 2022 boots into Python 3. However, by using an environment variable, the Maya team allowed users to still boot into Python 2. Now, the exception to this was the Mac version, which went to Python 3 only. Now, with Maya 2023, that ability has been removed, and from this point onwards, Maya will only support Python 3 across all three platforms. Windows, Linux, and Mac. So if you're updating your Maya, then consider your scripts and any pipeline components that you might have. And if you haven't fully converted to Python 3 yet, then it's worth going to Maya 2022 so you still have the ability to use Python 2. So that covers some of the obvious and small features in Maya 2023. Let's now look at some of the bigger stuff. And in terms of animation, the big addition is the Blue Pencil 2D drawing tools. Now these essentially replace the Maya Grease Pencil tool. And Grease Pencil was added some time ago and is really aimed at animators who wanted to mark up and annotate their frames. But it never really had a major update and it's been looking somewhat long in the tooth. But this new Blue Pencil tool set still lets artists draw 2D sketches directly in the viewport over their scene. But this time, uh, other disciplines can also use that feature. And you've got a more cleaner and non-destructive workflow as well. Now, you access Blue Pencil in the same way that you did for uh, Grease Pencil except now Blue Pencil has essentially replaced Grease Pencil. There's no longer any Grease Pencil options available to you in the UI that I could see. In the main toolbar here for the viewport, 
the icon that previously was for grease pencil is now being replaced with this one for blue pencil and when you select it you now get the new blue pencil main toolbar and just like with any other toolbar in Maya when it's got a dotted line next to it you can tear it off and then dock it to any other part of the UI that you wish to. There used to be an option here under camera tools for the grease pencil tool that's now been completely removed and I think the only other area that I could see where you could access blue pencil was under the animation menu set under visualize there's now an option for blue pencil here. Now once you've activated the blue pencil uh, the first impressions are it does pretty much the same thing as what grease pencil did so I can choose uh, like a paintbrush a pencil or an eraser and just start painting and I'm on frame one and I move forward to another frame and as soon as I start painting here the previous frame gets grayed out or like ghosted and that continues really for however many frames I start to paint on so that's all kind of pretty much the same uh, and of course I can erase it if I want to as well but now you've got extra capabilities we can now add some text if we want to we can choose to add some lines we've got some arrows for highlighting or pointing to a particular uh, area in the frame and we've also got some basic um, shapes as well so you've just got just a little bit more functionality and essentially what this does is this turns this tool from a simple artist tool into now a more broader annotation tool that could be used by anybody really the grease pencil tool was okay but it really always gave the impression it was really aimed at artists and animators who are drawing onto the frames which really kind of limited its exposure and limited its usage but i think now this really opens up uh, the blue pencil to be used in a lot more different areas and, and disciplines now as before the grease pencil did also have a toolbar but it didn't have anywhere near like the number of options here so you've got some simple things around you can turn the ghosting on and off here we you can choose to do some retiming of some of the uh, frames that you've that you've that you've actually drawn and the the timing options work the same way as what grease pencil uh, uh, did you can uh, shift select in the timeline down here and just drag your frame to wherever you want it to and then just release it and you just moved it that sort that's all the same as what you could do with grease pencil but you've now got these options to say you can add a frame clear it delete it duplicate it cut copy and paste uh, you can go jump to the next frame or previous frame here as well and you've also got options to import and export any drawings into the current frame so this is a lot better than what was um, previously in Maya with the grease pencil tool because you've just got more options front and center to the user whereas previously they were kind of buried away in the attribute editor and they weren't really very accessible so it's already a lot easier to use now there's also an extra little, extra little bit of functionality around here around transforming certain things as well uh, for example if I go to this frame now where these things are lit up um, I can actually transform something here as well with this little icon here if I select this I can draw a mark here around something and by right clicking it I can expose the functionality so I can cut and copy something I could just transform it and move it around over there in case I don't like it or I could even just say uh, I could flip it or uh, kind of revert the transform to where it was but as soon as I just move it anywhere and hit enter on my keyboard I've locked it down to where in its new position and again I can just choose to do stuff whatever I want so I've got way more flexibility than I had before but the real power of this tool set comes when it um, when you start uh, exposing the layers and you do that by going to your toolbox here and double clicking this icon here and this will open up all the main tool settings for blue pencil uh, so start at the top you've got some basic functionality around the drawing tools pencil brush uh, has got options for size opacity hardness you've also got some options here to turn on and activate uh, the tablet if you're using one uh, and then you've got some basic stuff around the shapes around the size and opacity and of course the draw color and you can change the font as well if you want to but then you move into the layering options and this is where things get really quite interesting um, so by default it adds uh, a single layer uh, so I'm going to delete that and you'll notice that everything has disappeared from my scene and I can now start essentially with a clean slate so I'm just going to go back to frame one 
I'm going to add a layer here with this option here. And I can choose to now double click this and give it uh, a name, just whatever random name I want. I can make it invisible if I want, or even lock it down if I don't want anybody to uh, mess around with it. And also I can choose to make it static. And what the static layer does is that layer will be persistently visible and available all the way through the timeline. Um, so whenever you add a layer here, the blue pencil tool automatically uh, assumes that it's going to be animated. You're going to add some frames, at, you can add some uh, frames at, at different points in the timeline. But by making it static, it will remain constant all the way throughout. So it's really good if you want to um, have text always visible or if you want to import a drawing or some kind of annotation that's going to be your background, for example, that you always want to be visible, that's a good use of making it to be static. Uh, so I'm just going to scribble something here, do a bit of random and go like that, and that's fine. And now I want to add uh, another layer. Uh, so then what I can do, I can go back to frame one again. It's still visible, of course, because I've got my previous layer. I'll double click it so it's not confusing. I'll give it a random name. This time, though, I want to change the color. So I'll choose something uh, like green. And then start drawing here. And of course, as I'm scrubbing the timeline, it, you'll see the other, the other layer as well. So I can easily just turn that off and say so I'm a bit confused now. And I can only work on one layer at a time. And you'll notice that when I jump between the layers, the annotations in the timeline will also change to match as well. So you always know what layer you're working on. Now, what I can do as well is um, the layers or your drawings are assigned on a camera basis. So at the moment, these are assigned to the perspective camera. If I right click a layer, I can choose to move it to another camera. So at the moment, I've only got my perspective cameras available to me. But if I started adding another camera in my scene, and say this, just move it over there, and this add another one and just move it over there, go back to my blue pencil, right click this layer and say move it to camera one. And you'll note that it's completely disappeared. And that layer has now been assigned to that particular camera, which is why it's not visible because I'm in the perspective camera. If I now jump to my camera one, my frame has now become available. So this gives you really uh, quite a powerful capability. So you can start annotating different layers and frames to different cameras. You can have as many here as you want and you can continue to start adding as many as you want really it's quite powerful uh, and of course you've got all the kind of flexibility that you actually want now below this you've got some options around the ghosting so you can choose to maybe um let's make that layer visible again so you can choose to override the colors for example so at the moment you've only got one color and it's based upon what you painted uh, with to begin with but if you wanted to you could override it and that sets the pre and post frames to be particular colors. Or you can even change the color if you want to and choose whichever one that you want. And this is the same basic functionality as what's in the new ghosting editor that got added into Maya 2022. It's the same functionality, so they're basically using the same module. So if you've been using this ghosting editor, then you'll be very familiar with how it works under the Blue Pencil tool set. Um, there's some basic options around about turning the ghosting on and off if you want to. You can set the number of pre and post frames as well. And you've also got the retiming options available to you here in the tool settings. And the frame options here as well, like you know, adding a new frame, cut, copy, paste, and also jumping between the, the next timeline, uh, the, the next frame in your timeline. So all in all, it's not, it's not bad. I actually think it's a really nice little feature. And I think if you'd used the grease tool before, the grease pencil tool before, and didn't really like it and dumped it, I really think you should check this out because I think you might like this uh, this blue pencil tool a lot. It's got way more functionality to it than the grease pencil ever did. So it's worth checking out. And I think if even if you didn't use the grease pencil tool before because you assumed it was just for animators, then I think you're going to want to check this out as well because this really does give you the ability, maybe as a lead or a supervisor or a senior artist animator or even producer, 
to actually go in there and add annotations to cameras and frames as well and that can give you uh, and uh, that allows you to really provide better feedback to your artists and your team so overall i think this is a very good feature and a long overdue update to myers grease pencil so another feature that's had a long overdue update in Maya 2023 is the Boolean operations that form part of the Maya modeling tool set. Now, anybody who uses Maya for modeling will probably tell you that the Boolean operations were always very limited. They were clumsy to use, they didn't really do much, and they were also prone to crashing your scene. But now in Maya 2023, they've had a significant update. There's been improvements to the Boolean node itself that allows artists to create and edit the Boolean operations with fewer clicks. And they've also added a new Boolean stack, which makes it easier to edit the message live and preview potential changes in your scene. So whether artists are changing the Boolean operation um, or adding new meshes to an existing operation, the, the, the Boolean algorithm's been updated now, so it calculates things automatically, and it simplifies the whole operation in a more procedural way. And it also allows artists to work non-destructively. So to give you a very crude example of that and how it works now, just going to select some basic objects in my scene, which are gonna be these four cubes and a cylinder. And I want to use this cube here as as the parent object. This is the object that I want to perform my booleans on. And then I'm just going to shift select the other, the other objects in order. We now go to the mesh menu, which is where our boolean operations reside. And you'll notice that together with the main three that we had by default, we now have an additional five operations that we can now choose. Now I just need to get the operation started. So the boolean node gets added to my parent object and I can now start the whole process. So I'm just going to choose the first one here, which is union. And straight away, uh, we can see that uh, we now get the new Boolean stack added to our attribute editor. And you can see all the objects that we chose and selected in order listed here. Now this is basically all the objects that are um, being uh, calculated as part of this Boolean operation. Now we only chose a union, so you can't really see much at the moment. But what I can now do is choose to deactivate these at any time I want. So I've just turned off the cylinder and I can then in turn deactivate all the other objects. So I'm only left with two. I've got the main one that I chose first, my parent object. And then I've chosen this second cube is the next object that I want to use for my Boolean operation. Now we chose a union as the default Boolean operation. So you can't really see much at the moment. But now with this new stack workflow, we can change the operation on the fly. We can change our minds. So I'm now going to go to my cube and I'm going to choose this option here with this little arrow. And when I select that, I can choose any one of the Boolean operations. So I'm going to choose, say, difference like A minus B. Now that will do something, but you can't really see anything because both objects are on top of each other. So I can actually now choose the object here. If I select it in the stack, it will become live in my scene. Uh, I'm actually going to just pin my attribute editor open now. So no matter what I do, the stack will always be uh, kind of locked in. And now when I move my object, I, I'm now performing the Boolean operation live. So I've now got this kind of intersection. So now I've made that choice. I can now go back to the next object in my stack and activate that and now choose the same operation or maybe change it. I may want to have maybe a difference from the B minus A. So again, when I do that, you'll see that the, the operation is performed in real time again. I can select my object here and even move it and you can begin to see the type of thing that it actually does. Or I could just say, well, actually, let's go back to the previous um, difference A minus B and then I can intersect things like so it scale it down so we see more of the object and actually maybe scale out like this. So I'm performing all of this in real time. Uh, you can see down here in the bottom left corner the algorithm doing the calculations like so. And you can see how easy it is, uh, essentially. Let's add the other object in now. And I'll do another, say, difference with that. Uh, and this time we'll do this, uh, maybe do that and then expand that out as well. 
and then finally we'll bring the cylinder in uh, which is a lot bigger but we'll scale this out before we make the change uh, and then we'll just have it poking out there and turn this into a difference as well and you can see i'm now intersecting the whole object so you can begin to see how easy this has been for me just to do this all in real time without having to really think about it But what's really cool about this workflow now is that I can actually add to this as well. Um, so let's say I'm working away and I want to add another object. So let's say I'll add a sphere. So I've got my sphere in my scene. I'll scale it out to something that may work for me. Um, let's just say move it to say there uh, on the corner. And now in, from the outliner, I can middle mouse click and drag it into the actual Boolean stack. And this adds that object to my Boolean operations and my stack. And I can now um, do the same amount of operations that I did previously. So I may want to change this and say, well, let's make this a difference here. And let's change the display mode to say wireframe. And you can see I'm intersecting the mesh in the same way there, look. Or reverse it so it's the same as all the other ones. And I'm now doing that. And of course, with the new display options now, I can make it say X-ray so I can see the object a bit more clearly. For example, if I just want to have a little bit more visibility before I decide to lock things down. Um, so you've just got way more options now that you than you ever had previously. And of course, you can even go back to the stack at any time and reorganize these layers to perform the functions in a different order if you want to change how the intersections work and where you want your billions to be applied. So again, you've just got a way more powerful uh, tool set. It's infinitely better than what um, we had previously in Maya, and it's really good to see these features get an update. So I think this really, this is a good feature for Maya 2023, and I hope it encourages people to go back and revisit the Boolean tools in Maya. Now, one of the things that the team have been trying to do with the Maya USD integration is trying to improve the ability to work with USD data once you have it loaded into your scene. If you load in the stage like I have now, there's only been so much you can actually do with it. You can't really manipulate the data itself. You've not been able to create any variants or make any material changes or even changes to the actual asset itself you can only really move it around and save any kind of those movements onto a layer now to give you an idea of that if we go back to my 2022 now this is the same pixar kitchen set loaded in as a usd stage and let's just say i wanted to uh, do something to this fridge door maybe change the uvs or make a change to the asset when i select the asset in the viewport and right mouse click there's no context menu here at all i can't really do anything with it um, like I would expect to with any other Maya data. So this is somewhat limiting. And what I have to do instead is uh, find the USD data for this uh, asset, import it in using the file import options here, and that converts it to Maya data. And then once it's in Maya, I can manipulate it, do any changes I want, and then I have to export that data again uh, to USD data, and then I can load it again uh, into my stage. Now, there's nothing wrong with that workflow. Uh, it's perfectly valid and sound, but it is a kind of roundabout way of doing it. Ideally, you'd want to be able to manipulate the data after you've loaded it actually into Maya itself. Well, this is what they've been able to do now with Maya 2023. If we go back into Maya 2023 now and look at the same Pixar kitchen asset in USD. Again, this has been loaded in as a stage. And if I select the same uh, fridge door now, we could find it in the hierarchy here. And of course, I've got this variant loaded up, but it doesn't really matter because the um, the body is its own separate prim. Now, I want to do something to this door, and it could be anything, UVs, I want to maybe manipulate it in some way. But now when I right mouse click it here in the viewport, I now have two options. I can edit it as my data or duplicate it as my data. So if I choose edit as my data, what this happens is it pulls that poly mesh from the hierarchy, from the USD on hierarchy, and it now separates it as its own node in the outliner. And now when I uh, select it in 
the viewport, I now have this, the, the normal My Context menu with all the My features and commands that I wish to use. So again, I could do color sets, UV sets, I could assign a material. I can even manipulate the mesh as well. So if I did something silly and obvious now and just moved it like that and say that I've made a manipulation, I now want to push these changes back into the original USD asset. So now right clicking on the asset again, I don't even have to convert it to object mode. There's an option here at the very top, merge uh, edits to USD. I can even discard the Maya edits as well if I want to. Now, before I do this, so there's a little option box here. Now, if I uh, just also select this, this brings up a number of options that I can choose when I want to push this data back into the hierarchy. Now, I'm not going to make any changes here, but it's just to give you an idea of what's now available. And now, one of the important things here is this first option about the plugin configuration. And I can choose none or Arnold. And what this means is that if I've assigned any Arnold shaders to this asset, and my USD data that I pulled it from also has Arnold data, then I can push that back together so it all reconciles correctly. I'm going to leave mine at none because I don't have anything Arnold assigned to this. There's options to do with the geometry here about the subdivisions, color sets, UV sets, and so on. I can even choose options around the materials as well, the USD preview surface, render man, and also new material X support, which is now available in the latest version of the plugin. But I'm just going to leave it as is for now, just, just choose Merge. So now I've done that, you'll notice that the asset has now gone from my outliner, and it's also now back into the actual um, hierarchy of the prim that I pulled it from. So that's really now available to you um, for any USD asset that you load natively via the stage option. You can actually convert it to my data in the scene, do anything you want with it, and then push it back into the hierarchy. Now, I, I selected it here in the viewport, but if you right mouse click here in the outliner, you also have the option uh, as well. Now, with the option that I didn't select to duplicate as my data, what this essentially does is allows me to duplicate any object uh, in the scene, any USD object. And by doing this, it almost it does create a duplicate. So if I did the entire body, then say, right, this right mouse click that, duplicate as my data, it copies it all and, and creates it as a whole new node inside my outliner. Now, it's rotated because the original um, axes for this asset was Z up. And I've done a, I've actually done a minus 90 offset already because my scene is Y up. So that's why that's flipped over. But of course, I can just go here now and also apply the offset in the usual way. And now I've got this, it's just um, normal Maya data. Um, so I can do whatever I want with it. Now, why would you do this? Well, you may want to use this as a basis for any other kind of modeling improvements. You may want to take this data and share it with somebody else in another scene or uh, export it out into another format. But essentially, it allows you to access the data from the, the USD asset you've loaded in, and it gives you a lot more creative choice over what you want to do with it. Now, aside from the normal updates, one of the things to really look out for is the new connection between Bifrost and USD. With the latest Bifrost and Maya USD plugins, it's now possible to use Bifrost to load USD stages and also manipulate data, including building scopes and composition arcs. And by using Bifrost, it really does allow users to tap into the power and procedural based workflow that Bifrost provides in order to work with USD data in your scene. Now, there's a lot to cover here, and I'm not going to be able to do it all in this video. So what I'm currently doing is creating some additional and more detailed videos that hopefully show the Bifrost USD workflow. So look out for those and subscribe to my channel. So what I'm going to do now is provide a very simple and somewhat crude example of how you work with Bifrost and USD together. In this example, I've got the Pixar kitchen set loaded into my scene, but instead of using the Create Stage option here, and also, instead of not using the import option here, I've decided to use Bifrost to load in my USD data and also perform a simple manipulation. If we look in the outliner, I've got a Bifrost graph node and there's now a my USD node as I would expect. And if we expand out the hierarchy, everything's loaded in exactly as it should do. So to help me work with Bifrost and USD together, I've created this new 
my workspace that just makes it easier for me to see all the components that I need in one place. Most of the real estate is taken up with the actual Bifrost graph editor itself, which is here. And on the left, I've got three separate panels. I've got an outliner, the USD layer editor, and then a normal Maya viewport so I can actually see what's going on. If we load up the graph now, I'll just go through a very simple explanation of what I did here in order to achieve this effect. It's a normal Bifrost graph. It's got it output and input nodes, but you'll notice I'm not using an input node um, like I usually would when normally working with Bifrost. Instead, I'm using a bunch of new and specific Bifrost USD nodes in order to manipulate this data. So this is the final graph I've got, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to unplug some of these nodes just to give you an idea of kind of how I started and then how I started to connect things together. So I want to load in the Pixar kitchen set USD file. Now, the first thing I, I started with was this node, the create stage. So this here defines a, a new stage in uh, USD and Bifrost. So this is gonna be my starting point. And I've given it a name, and I've called it kitchen underscore modified.usd file. Now I want to use a data set as the starting point for this new USD stage. And the data set I want to use is the Pixar kitchen set. And I then chosen this node here, which is an open USD layer node. And this is pointing directly to that kitchen set.usd. And you can see here that when I select it, there's the path name. So then from the output, I plug it into this sub layer node here. And then from here, I take the output, which is the stage, and I plug it directly into my Bifrost output. And we now have the data loaded in. So this is about as simple as it will get, really. You open up the data set as a layer, you plug it into a create stage, and then Bifrost executes that and loads that data. Now I want to use layers as part of my workflow. So I've then used this create layer node. And what this allows me to do is to define a particular USD file as a layer, and then plug that into my stage as well. So I take this and I plug this into the sub layers as well. And that now adds a new sub layer. And also you'll notice that it's populated in my USD layer editor. And I can choose now to add however many layers I want. Um, it's really very simple. If we right mouse click here in the create stage node over sub layers. At the very bottom there's an option here, create node. And I've got two choices. I can choose a create USD layer or open uh, a USD layer. I may want to bring in an additional USD data set. I'm just going to choose USD, uh, create USD layer. And that's plugged the node in automatically. And you'll see it's also populated in my USD layer editor. And from here, I can give it a name and point it to a directory where I want it to be output. So I'll just choose something very simple for this example, kitchen underscore Annie. And as soon as I enter the name, it populated in the USD layer editor. So that's got everything working fine, and we're still executing and everything's updated live. But of course, the problem we've got is the orientation of the data set is wrong. It's originally set to Z up, and my Maya scene is Y up. So what I want to do now is to perform a manipulation to essentially transform this um, whole data set so it's pointing in the Y up. Now, I could do this on the Maya node here and do it through the outliner and attribute editor, but I want to do it with Bifrost because it keeps everything in one place. And also, by using Bifrost, it really expands out the capabilities as well. And that's what I've done here with this add to stage. So essentially, if you if you follow the basic underlying Bifrost principles, I've got a data flow coming from this create stage to the output. And I want to interrupt this data flow with an addition. I want to add data to this flow. And what I want to do is I want to add a definition, a prim definition. And the definition I want to add is an X form. And if you're familiar with USD, then you'll know what that actually means. And this is where this node comes in uh, to play. So this define USD prim node allows me to create a specific Bifrost USD prim definition and allows me to connect anything into it as well. So you can see here, just by looking at the node, I can plug in variant sets. 
reference definitions, and also additional attributes as well. Now, for this example, I want to apply an attribute and I want to apply a transformation, which is where this node comes in, which is a define USD transform. So this is a specialized compound which allows me to perform transformations on my USD stage or a USD layer or a USD prim of any kind. And you can see here, I've just put in a minus 90 in the X. So this has gone, this is an attribute. So it's gone into my attribute definition port of my X form node, define USD prim X form. And then that's gonna be added in as a prim definition to my stage. So now I want to take the output of my create stage plug it into there. So now I'm taking this source data, the original base layer, the additional layers, I'm now going to add a transformation, a minus X transformation onto my stage. And then the output of that will go into my node, the, my Bifrost output node. And you can now see that my entire stage is now orientated correctly. So this is, again, as simple as it gets really in terms of uh, loading USD data in Bifrost and doing a simple manipulation. I know this is a somewhat crude example, but I'm just trying to give you a basic highlight and overview of how, kind of how this works. Now you might be thinking, why do it like this if you're just gonna do a simple transformation and also uh, to create layers? You could have done this through the layer editor, you could have done this on the Maya node and via the attribute editor and the channel box. And that's entirely true. However, what this now does with Bifrost is that it opens up all the power of Bifrost. You can use all the usual Bifrost features to then manipulate and work on top of USD data. But by plugging Bifrost into USD now, Autodesk have allowed users to essentially really tap into the full scope of workflows that are available to you for USD. And that's for things like creating references, instances and importantly variants because at the moment without this integration there's not a way to create a variant set in the Maya USD integration but now with Bifrost you can and once you start creating those definitions and the variant sets then you can now create entire USD stages in Bifrost and then output that to an entirely new USD file itself. So this really does open up the opportunities now for people to really harness USD properly inside the Maya. Now, aside from the normal updates to the Maya USD integration, there's also been updates to Arnold to support those updates and make it easier to work with USD files with Arnold itself. So if we take this scene as an example, this is an NVIDIA USD dataset. It's the attic scene that you can download from their website. So this is a USD data set that was created and authored to work with NVIDIA's Omniverse, which is their new GPU platform. Now, I want to also bring this USD file data set into uh, Maya, and I want to render it with Arnold. Now, there's a number of options that I could choose to do that. But what I've decided to do now is load this in as an Arnold stand-in. I don't want to make any changes to the hierarchy or the structure of the USD file itself. I just want to load it in and render it. So this is what I've done now. I've created an Arnold stand-in and I've pointed it to this NVIDIA attic.usd file. Uh, now I'm just going to change to a different uh, workspace so I can just uh, see my Arnold render view. And what I'm going to do without doing anything else, I'm just going to kick off the IPI renderer in my Arnold render view. And this to see what we, uh, what we get to begin with before we start doing any further work. So we can see after a few seconds, uh, the Arnold render uh, has started to kick in and we can now begin to see our scene being rendered, but it's really bright. There's obviously uh, something wrong with the lighting here because this lighting's been configured to work with Omniverse. It's not been configured to work with Maya uh, and or Arnold. Now I want to go in here and change this lighting, but of course as a stand-in file uh, with it selected, I can move it around my Maya scene, but there's nothing in the outliner for me to actually adjust. But now in Maya 2023 and the updates to USD and Arnold, I can now see the contents of my USD file from the attribute editor. And from these contents, I can expand out the hierarchy and begin to see what's inside the USD file. So I can look at the geometry for the scene. I can look at the USD looks, which is what contains some of the uh, 
uh, shader options. But more importantly, I can go to my lights and I can see that there's three lights here in my scene. Now these are set to Omniverse lights. So we've got a dome light, which is uh, essentially the same as the Arnold dome light. We have a distant light, which is uh, I think very equivalent to the directional light. And we have a ball light, which is a point light. So what I want to do now is I want to override some of these values. So if I select the node here in this list, I can now choose an operator or an assignment to add to this and essentially start overriding what's inside my USD file. But this time I'm doing it in Maya and with Arnold. So I'm going to click on Add Assignment and Skydome Light. And now I can choose any one of these properties and values to, to essentially override my dome light. So let's just choose an obvious one, which is intensity. So just as soon as I add this, the IPR will update straight away. And already it's beginning to look a little bit different. Uh, we can begin to see a little bit of a sky there. And I've only got it set to a default value of one, 1 1.0. But of course, this is now the difference between the, um, the Arnold dome light intensity and the Omniverse intensity. And again, I can choose to change this even further. So this say that I think it's still too light. So I could just choose to essentially just take it down even further to say 0 0.5. And we can begin to see the impact that does. And let's take it down even, say, lower. And we can begin to see now the sky has got very dark outside and that's also being reflected uh, in our scene. So I've done a very simple assignment there and I've lowered the lighting down quite low so we can get some visibility into our scene. And I could choose to maybe compensate that by maybe increasing the exposure, for example. So again, I could crank this up quite a bit so we can maybe get a little bit more of the, um, the sky in the scene again. So now we can begin to see a little bit more detail into our scene that we otherwise had lost by lowering, um, lowering the intensity. But what I would normally do on this type of environment is I'd then think about adding maybe a, a light portal into my scene so I can get some of this light coming from the outside and into my interior. But the problem is they only work with a, an Arnold Sky Dome light. They don't work with these lights. So how do we get around that? Well, we can just choose to disable this, these local overrides if we want to. I can simply just turn them on and off here. But of course, they're still using all the lighting from the actual uh, USD file itself. So to add any Arnold lights to this scene is obviously going to is going to make this scene go even brighter. So what we can do with the whole lights group, we can add an operator and we can choose to simply disable all the lights in the scene. So we're now not using any of the lights that come with this USD scene. And now I can simply just add uh, an Arnold light as I would do in the usual way. So as soon as I've added that, you can see the scene has started to change. I uh, just want to maybe uh, just make a few changes here just to make this a little bit larger, like so. And then uh, we can choose to maybe uh, change some of the values here. So the exposure is quite low. So let's get this to three, increase some of the sample size a little bit as well, maybe increase this to say four. And also go into our render settings, increase the ray depth a little bit as well. And we're beginning to now render this scene using Arnold lights and um, not the lights actually uh, that are in the USD scene itself. So now with the Arnold dome light in, we can now begin to add some of these specific Arnold features uh, that will give us better lighting. So one such thing is a light portal, for example, so we get this into our scene and this is really good at directing light directly into um, our scene because it really helps direct the light into a certain place. And look, look, as I'm just scaling that up there now, you can see how even though I've not got the light portal orientated correctly, how it's able to kind of help light go into that room from the sky dome light itself. So this just rotate that around and look at the difference that actually makes. The sky, the, these light portals are really cool and they're a really good idea if you want to try and light uh, an interior uh, without having to add too many lights in your scene. So what you usually do here is just get this positioned 
over your window, for example, um, just like so. So zoom in here a little bit and just tune this up. And the further in or out of the window, um, that you, the, the further the portal is from the window will have an impact as to how much light comes into this scene. Um, so, of course, if, look, if I move the portal uh, away, you can see the room gets slightly darker. Whereas if I move it right up to the window or the gap there, uh, you can see the light really starts to pour in. And, of course, anywhere where you've got a window, uh, you're going to want to have these. So I'm just going to duplicate this, move it in front of this, this grilled window here as well, and we can get some of the light coming in here as well. And once you go into the... Uh, this sky dome light for Arnold, you can begin to set the portal mode. Uh, so at the moment it's set to interior only, which basically means it won't light anything from the exterior. But then if we just change this just to see what it does, you can begin to see now it's trying to light the exterior and the interior because we've got various gaps in this scene. So there's no glass here whatsoever. It's just an attic with like a, an empty space. Uh, but again, this might look a little bit too bright for you. So again, you can always just change it to interior and you get something maybe a little bit more realistic. And you could then start to add some some extra lights in your scene or start maybe increasing the exposure a little bit more to compensate. And look, you can just see I begin to boost it just that bit more. And by having the light portal there uh, as well, you really begin to make the lights and the environment work for you. Because look, just by adding another duplication, I've got light coming into this space. And then also round the back here as well, because in the in the back of the scene, it's very, very dark. So again, we can uh, duplicate the portal here and try and move it into the back here and see if that does anything. Uh, perhaps this opening here. And look, just by adding that in there, you can see now that light is beginning to just backfill, kind of background in the attic a little bit. And of course, you can just maybe move it away from it a little bit and it'll begin to get a little bit darker. So you just want a little bit of light come in there just to show there's something there, but you don't want it to overpower the actual scene. So we've got some basic Arnold lights going uh, on in this scene. There's still more work to be done. It's not perfect. I'm just really going to give you a very simple example. Another thing you can do as well is start overriding the actual shaders. Uh, because again, the shaders would have been built in this USD file to work with Omniverse. And again, we may want to use Arnold shaders in this scene for uh, particular assets or even the entire um, the entire scene. So I'm going to select this tablecloth here. And when we open up the hierarchy, we can see the instance materials for it and the shaders. So I'm just going to select the actual tablecloth itself and what i'm going to do now is i'm going to essentially add a new shader assignment we go to add assignment and choose shader and now i'll have an option here and it, you can see this rendered blank so at the moment it's got no shader assignment we've overridden that and now i just assign a normal shader in the usual way so i'm just going to choose maybe the, the arnold standard surface shader and of course once i've got that here i can choose to Changes to uh, maybe a color if I want. So I'm just doing. I'm just going to do something really extreme so you can see it update in the scene. And of course, I could even use a preset here as well if I want to, and uh, just use velvet for example. And yeah, you can see how easy that was just to essentially override the shader on that object. And now I'm using an Arnold shader overriding the existing shader that was included in the USD file. So as you can see, with the updates to Maya, USD and Arnold, it really does become a lot easier and more flexible to work with USD data in your scene, regardless of where that USD data has come from. So you're no longer restricted. If you've got USD data that's come from another software package and it could have been authored differently and maybe the lighting and the shading setup is not compatible with Arnold, then you don't have to necessarily bring that uh, data in as an actual uh, USD stage or import it into Maya. You can load it as an Arnold stand-in and then apply all the overrides that you need in order to get the result that you're looking for. So now we've reached the end of this video, I'll give you my thoughts on this new Maya release. I think this is a very good release. It's a solid release from Autodesk, but it feels more like a point release for 2022 
instead of a new a version of my with lots of new features um many of the features in this release have come from 2022 and also the point releases and then there's they've only added like three additional new features into this version which are the bifrost usd functions the uh, blue pencil and the improved billions so i can see some people may be feeling a little underwhelmed however those features are still very very good i think it's really exciting to see how bifrost can expand the usd capability in maya the blue pencil is going to be a useful addition to many people i think uh, and again the boolean functions are just infinitely better than what we had before um, and again it's perhaps maybe in response to some of the other packages out there who have just got a far better and more powerful feature set in that respective area but aside from that there's lots of small things as well there's lots of small enhancements some of which were in my 2022 as well and they've just kind of been continued and tweaked further in this new release as well so i think overall it is a good release uh, some will find it underwhelming but i think overall there's some steady progress being made by autodesk and it'll be very interesting to see what happens now for the remainder of this year and if there's any uh, future point releases and what they might have in them if you want to know more about the previous features in my 2022 and the point releases then check out my channel and these videos here they go into those versions and features in in greater depth than what i've done here because i didn't want to repeat myself for this particular video but i think you'll find those really useful and there's some really good stuff because if you're coming from an older version of maya then you're going to leap uh, over several versions and you might come in straight into maya 2023 so you might this will be a massive release compared to something like maya 2018 or maya 2019 thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next video